competition here, so you all earned it. Um, and I'll call on the teams really quickly just to make sure we have everyone in the right positions and uh, in the right team order. As I do so, uh, feel free to offer uh, preferred pronouns, however you by no means obligated to do so. And throughout the round, we'll be referring to you uh, based on your speaker position and team position. Uh, in the government, we have Seattle UTD uh, CQ. Yes. 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 Closing government, UAA, ACGM. Jeremy speaking first, no problem. Haley speaking second, no problem. Okay, thank you. Closing opposition, UBC, NSAG. Um, Andrew speaking first, no problem. And I will speak the second. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, without further ado, uh, we will call upon the Prime Minister to present a speech not to exceed seven minutes and send some motion. Okay. Okay. We have the right to choose what we are going to do with our lives. So if a soldier is in combat, 
and they see that they do not really want to do this anymore, and they feel that they should be um, doing something else that expresses them better. They have the right to choose that other path. They have the right to exit the military with dignity and their honor intact. Yes. So is your implication that all deserters need for like the moral like obligation to peace, or could there be other reasons, like perhaps escaping consequences of their actions? No, no, no. So that's the distinction between my two reasons. There's a difference between the right to moral conscience and the right to choose. The right to moral conscience is the right to decide what is right and wrong for you, and the right to choose is the, your ability to choose what you want regardless of the morality of your decision. So your right to choose is the right to choose. For example, there might not be a moral difference in choosing between being a music musician or a scientist. For example, there might not be a moral difference there, but you have a right to choose one or the other, and you alone are the arbiter of that choice. So what this does is it is violating our right to conscience and it is violating our right to choose if we punish those who have made a decision themselves. And number three, this is about also about society. And it would be incorrect if we weren't to talk about the broader implications within society. Because society is composed of individuals, but there can be no society of a single individual. So this point is national unity and reconciliation. In many wars, and in almost all of those wars in recent history, the issue of that war becomes an extremely divisive issue for the people fighting in it and the people who are back home. For example, the Vietnam War is the prime example of this. Many commentators describe this period as one in which America was tearing apart at the seams. There are protests and counter-protests. Most people in during that time, like my grandfather, believed that the United States would fall during that period of time. They, they doubted the stability of the United States. We forget through the lens of time how violent and how just utterly unstable that period of time was and how dis divisive the issue of the Vietnam War was. And in the face of this, President Gerald Ford made a bold decision and he pardoned all of the draft daughters in order to heal the country. And this worked. And not only did he pardon the draft daughters, he pardoned the draft daughters in front of the, vet, uh, of the veterans of foreign wars. He did this in full knowledge of his own military status and he did this in full honor of his personal code of ethics. And this brought the country together. And not only, although this is not identical to our motion of, of making sure that these, these um, people are not punished for their actions, it that. would achieve similar results. Yes. So how well did the veterans of Vietnam fare once they returned home from the conflict? So the veterans of Vietnam did not, they returned home to the conflict, and they returned home to the ire of the people who lived in the country. But it would have been much worse if Gerald Ford and, um, and the likes in his administration did not try to reconcile the two halves of the conflict. It could have been much worse, as was evident in the protests and counter protests during that time, which oftentimes became violent. So it is very important for us in the face of war, in the face of conflict, to focus upon national unity and reconciliation between the people groups. Those who fight the war, and those who support the war, and those who are against it. It's extremely important for us to reconcile these two groups and to promote a sense of unity because what happens otherwise is, as they said, people will return home to a divided country, a country in which there is no unity, a country in which they feel alienated. We want to make sure that doesn't happen, whether or not you seek to fight in the war or whether or not you do not seek to fight in the war. And for all these reasons of issues of individuals and society, I hope the government will be Prime Minister for that speech, and I call upon the leader of the opposition, I call upon the opposition bench. Here, here, Honorable panel, we think that OG vastly misinterprets the burdens in today's round when they paint you a very pretty a very pretty picture on how we should be respecting the lives of people who do not wish to be in the place of war, did not choose to be there, were somehow a pawn in a game and deserve to be let out and create a better place. 
on-site opposition, we agree with that narrative. But we also must engage with the motion today that this house, uh, this house would pardon all deserters at the end of major war campaigns. And insofar as their analysis doesn't prove as to why all people flee wars, we tell you that there are others who are not deserting just for the sake of, I need peace and to escape a war, but others who understand that their consequences in that wartime may have lead them to, uh, their actions in that wartime may lead them to face greater consequences in the future. And for that reason, we don't think we should be pardoning those deserters. There's a very important distinction to make, and we don't think that they solve for you as to why we should pardon all of them. But before I get into my two points on pardon on policy matter, one that is war criminals deserve punishment, and second is a clear delineation of morals. I'm gonna get into some thematic rep on their second matters. Okay, so what they bring to you first is that we as individuals uh, have the right to decide uh, you know, on our, on our morality, and then secondarily on the principle of what we're acting on. Uh, and that's essentially the spine of what they get to in their third point. When what we, uh, one, we tell you two things. First, that it's a categorical, and I've already kind of addressed this a little bit, we don't have to defend for all of the people who we think are genuinely innocent in the situations where they were forced to be a child soldier or where they were not drafted but instead pulled into a military by some oppression regime. However, if we tell you that if a war criminal did some very terrible shit, they should be punished. And under their framework, where we tell you that it is the individual's right or ability to choose whether or not you know he agrees with the morals that you know he's acting on, we tell you that these war criminals will just tell themselves, oh, you know, I'll do whatever it takes to survive. I don't think that the you know dilemma of what is morality is going to stop someone who has been you know doing horrible humanitarian crimes from continuing. And then the second is on national reconciliation, and they say that there's a lot of disagreement on war practices and uh, you know how it pans out. One, we tell you that we can reconcile about this by not you know by not participating in war or disastrous solutions if that's what like the country is so torn up about. But second, we tell you that by by pardoning, uh, you know, pardoning draft dodgers is not the same thing as pardoning those who killed civilians and children, and we think that they need to engage with this on the side of the house when we're talking about the people who fought in Vietnam, because they are not the same crimes to drop to dodge a draft and to uh, get killed civilians. That's a humanitarian uh, uh, crime. Getting into my points of positive matter now. First, on how war criminals deserve punishment. A little bit of historical context that's going to kind of um, contest what they brought earlier. Let's look at the 1940s in Nazi Germany. Again, I'm sure that you're all expecting this example to be coming. But towards the end of the war, when we saw that things were coming down and it was not looking so good for the Germans, a lot of the infantry troops and soldiers were rounded up by people who were occupying the land. But the high officials that actually had something to do with the way that the regime had been working and orchestrating what the actors that they wanted to take knew that they would face serious consequences by the international community by the end of the war for the atrocities they committed. And thus fled to countries super far out in South America, like Argentina, where they would have hopefully no chance of uh, hopefully no chance of being caught. And at the end of the day, they are deserting the war that they were in originally taking uh, part in. And so in a war where some people need to escape violence and protest, that's totally fine. But we tell you that to save all of them is not, right? So we tell you that by giving a pardon to everyone, we engage with the danger of letting a very bad person free. And that we must have some sort of uh, kind of court uh, hearing or some sort of uh, you know, public appeals court that lets us make a decision on is this person viable to be pardoned or not, right? Because we tell you, I'll get to it in just one second, I'm sorry. By allowing these people to go free, we, that we think that it's much easier for them to get off the easy hand, to spread their ideology, or organize in another part of the world because they're just let go by this pardon. So we don't think we solve for the long-term war criminals on their side of the house by simply pardoning everyone who was in a war, uh, who activated in a war camp, or was in a war campaign, yes. Pardoning someone? For desertion is not the same as absolving them of every act they committed in war. Obviously, we would still prosecute war criminals, but that's a different matter entirely. Why does this matter specifically with deserters? Well, we think that if you were prosecuting, if you're prosecuting war criminals, you have to also prosecute them for deserting. We don't think that we don't think that you have to prosecute people who are not in the position of a war criminal for deserting. But if they were war criminals looking to leave because they understood the consequences were that to be wronger uh, than in the long run, uh, then they're on. I think we hold them to that standard as well. Uh, second point, a clear delineation of morals. If at the end of the day, we want a clear picture on who deserves punishment and who deserves to be left alone, I think this requires some sort of uh, commonality or agreement, uh, similar to how they have in Nuremberg trials, in which they actually looked at evidence as to what these people did and came to some sort of punishment or agreement. A lot of times it was just death. 
Uh, and so we tell you that because uh, the status quo of other countries, um, where they expedite, uh, expedite people as deserters, but not on crimes or ideology, this is very problematic. And I think this is something that we solve uniquely on our side of the house by not deserting everyone, uh, by not pardoning everyone who is a deserter, right? Because it is a very destructive narrative that uh, only can be changed when there's unity behind who deserves to flee and who does not deserve to flee in that situation. Uh, people should not be extra, uh, ex extradited, I don't know if I said extradited earlier, maybe I did, extradited simply for fleeing a war, and unless we can differentiate the two, we don't actually get to that sort of, uh, you know, uh, agreement or that sort of unity behind the solvency that we're looking for. We don't actually uh, get to say that, you know, we should be expediting people not because they flee a war, we should be expediting them because, or ex, ex, that word, because they are, because they are, you know, they had committed some serious crimes in the war that they took part in in the past, or they're a very dangerous person. We think that in order to get to those roots of why people should be kicked out of a country, not just simply because they're a deserter, and in many times the status quo, this is the case. Putting into a couple of impacts of that. Uh, or actually some uniqueness on the side of the house. The people who they really advocate for, you're right, the good guys in the scenario that are in an unfortunate situation and have the ability to, uh, and should have the ability to be pardoned for being part of for being a cog in part of a larger scheme that they had no hand in, we think have little to no benefits when fleeing to another country on their side of the house insofar or as long as the ability for countries to expedite people who are just simply there for fleeing war crimes. We should instead look to bring some uh, larger conclusion and unity around the idea of what people should be being, what people should be kicked out of other countries for, and we think that the standard of just uh, being uh, uh, fleeing war or being a deserter is not a good enough one to keep people out of other countries. So, insofar as we, we want to see like the safety for those people who are escaping to another place or who are deserting, we don't actually get that until we can bring the international community uh, around like an idea that says, "Hey, some people will, some people who are deserting very much deserve to be there, while others should definitely be kicked out." And as long as this notion exists in the categorical, we think that all of those sides still stand on. I would be thankful for your opposition that you should not call upon the Deputy Prime Minister to close out the top half of the government's bench here. such as AWOL soldiers on the ground with the right to free thought, to moral conscience, to safety, and for the sake of the nation as an entirety. The government is choosing to be concerned with the rights of the people serving in the military over a piece of paper that says you're potentially obligated to just because you signed that piece of paper. My partner has shown you that on the grounds of choice, moral conscience, and national reconciliation, the pardoning of deserters of major war campaigns is absolutely vital in the sense of promoting the values of freedom and peace that the United States espouses, but in the status quo does not practice. We believe that our side of the house is exclusive to actually getting to espouse those practices. So in this DPO speech, I'll be starting off some reputation and reframing before moving on to my own positive points of matter, those being one, the right to personal safety, and two, the right to a changing opinion, before summarizing the top half and why the panel should be voting for the government side on the grounds of rights. So first off, I would like to get into some reputation. This is a little bit awkward because, uh, well, first off, I want to get into one point. They say that the U.S. maybe should not be involved in wars at one point in their reputation. We do agree also, uh, one thing on the negative implications of war. In a perfect world, there is no such thing as war. We, however, also know that the United States, as a global world power, sort of ends up inviting itself into wars that we don't want to be involved in. As example, World War II, when we attempted to stay somewhat out of it, we ended up being attacked. And I don't want to say forced into it. It sounds a little bit harsh. But as a result, several, pe several people, some people living in America, were killed. And also, just kind of like, I don't want to say an obligation as a global power to fight in a war. But at the same time, as the world's greatest military power, we feel that as a consequence, we're sort of forced into these wars, and whether or not you kind of like it. We also 
um, their whole case kind of rides on this idea that a war criminal and a deserter are equitable. We find that this is vastly untrue. There's a difference between a war criminal and a deserter. You know, Maybe the deserter is this also a war criminal, that these are two very separate charges, the charge of desertion versus the charge of war crimes. You feel like you can't equate the two on the basis that one person did both. You feel like pardoning a deserter is pardoning them on the grounds of desertion, not pardoning them of their war crimes. You feel that this is very obvious and that this isn't something every agency didn't need to get into. But their whole case he's been writing on this idea, which we find vastly unfair because for the vast majority of deserters, they're deserting on the basis of moral grounds and moral conscience, not because they committed war crimes. But for those select few that have committed war crimes and have committed these crimes against humanity, we feel that yes, it is absolutely fine to try them on those grounds. But this is unrelated to desertion. We are pardoning them on the crime of desertion, not pardoning them on their crimes against humanity. Otherwise, we'd be having a debate on we should pardon all military crimes, period. No, this is a pardoning desertion. Pardoning the idea of leaving something that you now find morally unjust or for your own safety. So I'd like to get into my first point, and that's going to be the right to personal safety. And I'm going to be kind of relating this both to the aggressor side and the victim side. First to the aggressor side. Um, so we see a lot of soldiers deserting for the sake of their own personal safety. We feel that this is actually, you know, somewhat... Uh, constituted essentially because we feel that every, every human has a right to personal safety. Um, do you still have a POI, by the way? All right, we feel that every human should have a right to personal safety. We feel that we, uh, we say that soldiers ought to also have a right to personal safety. And if that means that they have to desert a situation that is intrinsically dangerous and intrinsically going to cause fatalities, then that is their right to do so. Yes? Why is it important that you don't charge war criminals with desertion? Okay, that should be pretty up. Uh, don't turn war criminals with desertion. That's so different because there's a difference between desertion and just leaving a situation and difference between that and killing several people. We feel that on the grounds of war crimes, that should be enough to justify a life sentence if you're killing several people for no good reason versus desertion, just leaving the area. So of course, we feel that it's extremely important to create the fact that there's a distinct difference between the two. We feel that also to just say that desertion as a whole is completely unrelated, and that's the best way to make sure that people who are supposedly just committing the crime of desertion remain innocent on the grounds that they're doing it for their own personal safety and for their own personal moral conscience. So once again, going back to my first point about personal safety, that I feel that we feel on the government side that soldiers also have, ought, ought to have the right to personal safety, that if they are in a dangerous situation, once again, where fatalities may be committed against them, or fatalities may be committed against others that they would be forced to commit, then they have the right to abandon that situation on the grounds of their own safety and others' safety for the sake of not creating more victims. Once again, relating to my partner's point on moral conscience, we feel that this is extremely important because moral conscience is one of the driving factors of human life. Moral conscience, it's everything. Every little decision we make is based off of moral conscience. That includes the decision to desert a situation that may result in the deaths of yourself or the deaths of others, not to mention your value as an individual means that you should be able to care about yourself and therefore be able to value your own personal safety. If you feel that the safety of the situation is affecting you personally, we believe you have the right to abandon that situation for the sake of your own safety. So I would like to get on to my second point, and that's the right to a changing opinion. So people's opinions, they change. Opinions are flexible, opinions are ever-changing, opinions aren't this rigid thing that we follow for our entire lives. There's plenty of people I know who, for example, their political ideas have changed, ideologies have changed just because of an election. We believe that the same thing applies to people's ideologies based off of the military and their views on war. Some one person who thinks, oh, I'm getting into a war that I should be getting into, has uh, some sort of moral obligation to be protecting my country, may, may arrive at the war and realize, oh, this is not true. I made sure, on one hand, maybe I am protecting my country, but I'm intentionally harming another and causing all these citizen damage to these citizens of this other country. My moral stance has changed on this issue. We believe people have the right to realize that moral stance, this moral change, that, and as a result, people have the right to abandon a situation that they no longer feel that they're constituted to be in. We find that intrinsically unfair to your rights as an individual to be forced into a situation that you don't want to be in. You don't want to be the reason that people are dying. That is fair. We don't want to be murderers. That's absolutely a fair position to take. We believe people have the intrinsic right to abandon a situation where they're responsible for the deaths and damage of others. So I'd like to kind of summarize the debate as a whole. What is open government showing you today? We showed you that we need to value the lives of deserters, not to disregard them because they felt they were involved in a war that they should not be in. Furthermore, we've shown that moral conscience ought not to be something quashed. 
especially when it is for the sake of safety and individual autonomy, as well as the safety and autonomy of others. Or sorry, auton yeah, autonomy, I said that right. We find it intrinsic to understand that morals are flexible and ever-changing, and for those who initially choose to serve to recognize their own change of heart and recognition of their own self. So if you support both the agency of the individual and the strength of the collective, and you value choice and moral conscience, we urge a vote for the proposal. Thank you. of their crimes. It took increased resources to 
go and find this person, to go like search them out, to probably extradite them in other cases, they should be punished for that resource um, and time frame that they uh, failed to fulfill because like obviously if they like, they should be punished for fleeing on the, on the basis of trying to get out of um, criminal action because like it took like increased time at which like victims are placed into like uh, like purgatory not knowing what um, is moving forward and it took resources to go and find them that was a financial strain on the system they should ought still be punished for deserving as it does harm both economically and people okay final um thing on the uh point of positive matter of our, a point of positive matter on the idea of internal accountability so we think that the, like issues of exceeding violence like civilian um like and brutality against them. Like these types of violence get rarely addressed within the status quo. And when they are, it is like there is like a serious damage behind that charge of dishonorable discharge that like charging through the military is a really similar, uh, serious thing when it actually does go through. We think that these are long and really brutal investigations. People are taking these, well, they take them a little bit too slowly in my opinion, but like not many resources are allocated towards like for following through on these investigations that they take a long time, that they don't, yeah, they, they effectively like defense soldiers at all costs. So like what happens to the system when we introduce their mechanism? One, we think that people under internal investigation are let out of their responsibility because if they know that it looks really bad, they can make that cost benefit analysis to discern without specific consequences for that desertion. We think that that is an immoral action that we are permitting on their side of the house. They, the, they can always just default to the idea that they can escape when it looks bad. Secondly, the idea that internal in investigation is in a world without punishment or concern for desertion simply like the investigation often would stop. Because in the United States, for so many of these cases, like are already ignored or already on like back files or yeah, back files that this will like only further that process because now you don't actually have to allocate resources to investigating people um, who uh, who have deserted and are no longer a part of your system. You don't have to keep your system regulating in a good way when people can just dip out if they're seen as like a not good participator in that system. So at the end of the day, kind of weighing out how this round is looking on government opposition. And like, we think that um, government fails their categorical burden when they don't talk to you about people who deserve for um, immoral reasons. We like, they can't simply talk about people who left on the basis of personal safety, but those who failed or who left on the basis of trying to escape consequences. We don't understand why uniquely deserters trying to get out of their criminal um, punishments or actions should be treated and should be absolved of that when like in the status quo people are already punished um, for trying to get out of your crimes, that there's a resource burden and that there's a, um, a, a victim uh, burden that they have to wait for like their, their um, uh, the, the bad person to come back. Um, so at the end of the day, until we get like an answer from the government bench about how like war criminals and these people ought to be punished for desertion and not just the war crimes, we are really proud to be here. Okay. All right, we need to thank the leader of opposition for that speech. Now we call upon the member of the government to back now the government's case here, here. Pardons for all of the other crimes. 
that just like committing a war crime. I think that there's other laws in place that are going to hold those types of war crimes accountable. But additionally, we, we're going to tell you how we're going to prevent war crimes from being happening by allowing a better discussion of what leads to people to desert for the, in the first place, what leads to these war crimes, et cetera, et cetera. The second point of deconstruction talks to you about this idea of extradition. We split, we say that nations are more likely to extradite on the basis of war crimes rather than desertion, and war criminals are viewed like much more seriously on their side. Um, now moving on to this idea of people who desert. Two points. First, I'm going to talk about patriotism. And second, I want to talk about how hardens deconstruct the toxic loyalty that we have seen in patriotism. First, on patriotism. Firstly, we would say that patriotism is the norm and culture that we have uniquely in the United States as modeled in the OG. We, first of all, that, this type of nationalism and patriotism means that there is this immense trust in the military because being seen as a soldier means that you are serving your country. But the problem is that this mentality of patriotism and this culture that we have means that we mask any ability to actually critique any problems that happen within the military or even foreign policy in general. Look to the fact that like, the Dixie Chicks were alienated because they criticized Bush in the early 2000s, right? This is inability to even say that perhaps the wars that we are engaging in are a bad thing because you're necessarily de um, uh, uh, alienated because you are committing a social taboo of defying the country. But additionally, let's talk about what happens within the military, right? This idea of patriotism means that there is this immense loyalty um, to the people within, uh, loyalty within pe people within your troop. We think that this, the, the bad thing about patriotism is that it protects bad eggs and protects um, a lot of uh, problems that happen within the military, such as like high rates of sexual assault against female soldiers, right? You can never deconstruct and, and actually advocate for better reforms because the conversation always focuses about how you cannot criticize the military and that patriotism it dominates the conversation rather than talking about like why these problems are happening in the first place. That's what happened with Bo Burka. People never really question why he deserted and left her post. Rather, they focus on the idea that he was a traitor and that he was defying his country. We're going to tell you how normalizing parties is going to get the better discussion. But some point B under this point, patriotism causes a lot of these people to desert in the first place, right? First of all, let's talk about who deserts. We think we get a good characterization of that a lot of people within the military are kind of coerced to be in the military. Even if there isn't a draft, we see that the military that we have right now necessarily gets a lot of low-income individuals, communities of color, to like serve in the military because they get a GI bill, they get the tuition paid, et cetera, et cetera. So you already have this coercive aspect that happens in the military. But now let's talk about why they deserve in the first place. Oh, he does a good job talking about how there's this moral consciousness that happens, but second, we would tell you that there's also just fatigue that happens when you're in Afghanistan or in Iraq, when you're alienated in a completely different place away from your friends and your family. You never get that type of comfort, you know, and you are, you are serving within a war, right? We think that the trauma that you suffer as a soldier and the alienation in a place that you are unfamiliar with leads to fatigue, at least to people not wanting to um, serve as a soldier. But we think that additionally, like, war criminals are just a very small minority of like the deserts that happen. We think that these are like the most likely cases of people who desert for their votes. So we think that the, the ultimate impact is that you're never going to get a constructive discourse of how to mitigate people who desert in the first place because you're always going to have this norm of patriotism that happens on their side. Sure. So like, even though war criminals are obviously a small percentage, why should they additionally be given pardons? We just deconstructed this, OD deconstructed this. Once again, we think that the war criminals are a really small minority of the deserts with the, these people who deserve in the first place. So I'm just going to move on. Second, how hard it is to deconstruct this toxic loyalty that, that, that uh, we have right now. First of all, symbolically, pardons are important first because they are this government apology that there is this injustice that happens. That's what happened with Vietnam and Carter and uh, the pardons there. But second, we think that this pardon is so important because pardons are so rare. Right? in the first place. And that signals to the public that the government is admitting a fault in a law that they have. We think that this big signaling to the general public is really important because then it allows <coughs> citizens to reanalyze the laws that they have. 
And we think that this better reflection of the injustice that happens not only with our laws within the military, but then also the way that we conduct foreign policy can lead to better flexibility and lead to people being open to talking about the types of military reforms and the way that we conduct foreign policy and the discussion that we actually need to have. So what happens then post-model? We think that first of all, we get better soldiers who are able to serve their country more adequately because they are serving with this idea of this moral consciousness that is more than just following orders but trying to figure out what is right. We think that second, we get this better mentality from brothers and people who serve with, an, uh, with individuals that deserve it because no longer is their brother a traitor, but they had to figure out what went wrong and what led them to deserve it in the first place. Third, we think the public can better advocate for change because you have now this normalization of pardons and deconstructing this idea of patriotism. But finally, we think we just change this idea of what it means to serve your country, what it means to love your country. It's not just this blind patriotism, but actually analyzing um, the things that are wrong with your nation. Thank you, member of the government, for that speech. Now, I call upon the member of the opposition, both on the back half of the opposition's case. Uh, we apologize for lack of time signals during that speech. In modern warfare, the death rate is relatively low, when soldiers, soldiers do not face the most risk while they are abroad. They are most at risk when they come home and find that their sacrifice is not valued, their struggles not gone unrecognized, and there are few resources available for their ailing mental health. What am I going to do for you today in this speech? I'm going to give you one really long extension with two sub points, and then I'm going to do some quick flash. So our extension. Soldiers are mostly hurt coming back from war. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to be a soldier. There's a very clear narrative that we think leads to principal injustice against soldiers. Soldiers, via public perception and inspired by contemporary culture, are seen as heroes. This is because they are seen as making a sacrifice. They are of their own volition, locking themselves into a conflict for the benefit of the collective. The individual sacrifices himself for society. They are usually seen as victims of a conflict. We contest the notion, in particular, that soldiers are invariably linked to the military arm. Many times they are completely disassociated from the government in front of which they serve. What does this mean? It means that currently society perceives that every single soldier has an op we have an obligation as society to protect those soldiers. But what happens when you pardon all deserters? When you pardon all deserters, that intrinsic value and that perception that we talk about are infinitely reduced. Why? Because it's now a job that you can quit. A job where you can leave before it is done. It is now, shockingly, shockingly a normal job. It is perceived by the public as a job for money. It has been demystified in the eyes of the voting public. And let me remind the panel that this demystification is on behalf of actions that soldiers did not do and which they were not responsible for. You are not responsible for if someone else chooses to shirk their duty and to leave. This is one of the first principal justifications about why it is unfair. This narrative is forever lost in the government world. Soldiers will not be respected for their sacrifice, and on closing opposition, we think this is principally unjust. But even if, if that wasn't enough, if you don't believe that the reduction and principal redress that soldiers lose is bad, then take our practical benefits too, about how mental health and other resources for soldiers are going to decrease in the world of the governments. Recognize that soldiers' benefits are hung on steadfast public supports. When the public sees the national service, that collective sacrifice, and all the values that we hold dear, 
are uprooted. Because you pardon some people who have shirked their duty, who have demystified their position, and taken away the principal obligation that society owes to its soldiers, support for soldiers is going to tumble down the cliff. Why does that matter? I'll take you in just a moment, but why does that matter? We think it matters because it will no longer be popular to find soldiers' resources through such things as legislatures who are responsible for funding or advocacy groups who lobby on behalf of soldiers' rights who have returned, or even nonprofit and non-governmental organizations who might have it in their interest to promote the mental health of a nation. We think that this just goes down. Sure, even when some soldiers deserve, the mass majority of the soldiers will still be sacrificing themselves for their country and the vision will remain intact. Sure, like a lot more if he wants. Okay, we say that the reason why your POI doesn't hold is because by taking the action of pardoning them, and not just pardoning some, pardoning them all, you're legitimizing their choice. This is another one of our mechanisms, that by the action of saying, this is an action that we consider acceptable, this is us taking that choice and saying that all of them are considered equal and alike in that regard, you categorically reduce the likelihood that you're going to have that public support. And why does that matter? It matters because that funding that you really want and want to protect for soldiers is going to fall. And what does that look like? And what does that mean for soldiers? It means a massive decrease in veteran supports. That is the first impact that we bring you. A decrease in counseling and for the substances that they need to cope. Oftentimes, soldiers who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder are constantly on like painkillers of some kind. They are on substance substances, or they are being counseled by people who are trying to make sure that they are able to process their trauma and to cope with what has happened to them. Government world is a world that is worse for veterans who suffer from PTSD. A world that has no respect, and a world where they are principally robbed of their rights as soldiers. Just because the government has chosen to pardon the deserters and to legitimize their cowardice. Okay, so now that I've given you my two point extension, let's do some clash. Out of the extension, we hear some interesting ideas. First, we hear the idea of a toxic national patriotism and that they're generally linked together. Sure, okay, we don't think that's true. We think generally that soldiers are perceived as victims. The reason why they're perceived as victims is because in the world where you are sent to a country and sacrificing your individual self, you are perceived as having to do something for the society. But even if that's not true, you are generally also perceived as something beyond the uniform that you, like beyond the governments that you represent. Sure, soldiers go to fight for America, but you, we like intentionally publicize the stories of individuals. The second reason, they talk about criticizing the, the army, right? Well, we say that in the world where you start taking away these protections, you're more likely to lose funding. This was the thrust of my extension. Moreover, they're seen as post separate institutions anyway. Third, they talk about alienation. And when you're weighing this round, Judge, I encourage you to consider, is this alienation that they bring you as much, or is it more, or less, sorry, as if when you are delegitimized at home, by your peers, by your family members, for something you are not responsible for. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor of the Opposition, for your speech, and now call upon the Governor Wick to vote off the Governor of the Senate. Thank you,
government's bench agree with each other. This is a motion to address two different types of issues we think are present in our society. First, we think it is to address structural problems within the military. But secondly, we think it is about cultural problems with patriotism and the way in which we view the military. The problem with opposition is that essentially their advocacy is to steer into the structural problems and steer into the jingoism we see in our society because somehow that is going to create the change that we have yet to see. Understand that whenever troops in Vietnam looked at their commanding officers and said, you can't make me fight anymore, that that's where we began to have discussions about what it means to be a soldier and what loyalty means. We only ever see reforms in the military whenever people protest the military, but whenever we silence that protest and say it is insubordination, that it is disloyalty, and that it is un-American, you never get to have that conversation in the first place. We have a cult of patriotism in our country, and we think that the first way in which we begin to have the discussion about the reforms that opposition also wants in this debate is only whenever we say that you can protest against the military in a way that we view as legitimate, that you're not automatically going to be stigmatized. Two questions in this debate. First, what is the context of desertion? But secondly, how can we best improve the military? First, what is the context of desertion? First, we think that it is coercion. And we think that regardless of whether we are talking about a draft or a volunteer military, that there's always some element of coercion. It is very easy to understand what that coercive element is whenever conscription and drafts are involved. But we think that even in a volunteer military, like we see in the United States, that military recruitment is often insidious and often targets people that are lower socioeconomic, that come from communities of color, because they say, look, the government hasn't really provided basic standards of living for you, but if you say that you will come and fight for us, then what we will do is provide you with basic things like health care and a house and the ability to get educated. That sounds like a really good deal when your government has left you behind, and we think that that is ultimately coercive as well. But we think secondly, we think that desertion is always a response to um, military failures and to these structural failures, right? My partner tells me about how it is often the response, and we get this from opening government to some degree as well, uh, like this is a, a response in rebellion to unfair wars, like what we see in Vietnam, or it is a protest to structural problems. We think that it is important to understand that in the military, you literally do not have the right to free speech. You must ask to speak freely. If you tell your commanding officer that you don't like the way they're treating you, or you, you are like trying to speak out against like being sexually assaulted, if you are a woman in the military, the problem is, is that you are not allowed to ever speak freely on that, and that will be viewed as insubordination, and you will be punished for it. You don't see the ability to have these reforms coming from within the military, because the literal structure of the military is to prevent that discussion. But lastly, we think it's about mental fatigue. Oftentimes, people that do desert are not war criminals. They are people who have taken so much that they cannot handle it anymore, and their brain is telling them to get out and to go anywhere else that is not the front lines. We think that we have to understand that you never address these problems on their side of the house. Even in the case of opposition, where they say, that sometimes these deserters are, are immoral, we think you never get a larger conversation about that. We are not going to paint the same rosy picture that opening government did, where they tried to act like all deserters are really just people who are trying to exercise their rights. We do agree that there are immoral deserters, but we think there are two types, right, in this idea of war criminals, right? First, we think that there are probably genuinely evil people. And then secondly, we think that there are those who have broken under military pressures and who have also been incentivized to behave in this manner by the military. The problem is that off world never gets discussion about why people behave in this way and why we see war criminals. Does the military try to recruit people that already have a prerogative and inclination to kill? Do military circumstances promote this idea of war criminals? Promote this idea of it's the front lines, nobody's watching, nobody's going to hold you accountable? Or does the military put people who have PTSD and are already showing the signs back on the front lines without ever realizing what that ends up meaning in the long term? But we can't have that discussion in our country because that discussion is viewed as being un-American. That discussion in the status quo does not exist outside of this room because of this toxic patriotism. Listen to the rhetoric from closing opposition. That is the rhetoric that we hear all throughout our country of if you say anything about the military, you're devaluing and disrespecting soldiers. You're devaluing and disrespecting the core tenets of our nation. We think that on that point alone, we win this debate. I would take top half if they have one.
wrong? Uh, sure. Just like in the interest of like discussion or like the comparative, it's not like it's not like we're advocating for no pardons to ever happen. You have to categorically defend all people getting pardons, not just like us getting them. Yes. So first, we think that literally on the basis of coercion, that's probably enough. But we think secondly, we think that it is more important in the long term because of the conversation this will create in our country. This is my partner's extension of how can we improve the military. We need to have this discussion about what are the problems in the military and why this desertion happened. But we think that toxic patriotism, this cult of patriotism, prevents. And it is because it is viewed as un-American. Even today, people who survived the Vietnam War and had to real, like, come to terms with the fact that there were draft daughters, even though they were pardoned, are still viewed in our society as being terrible human beings and being un-American. We think that we need a blunt statement from the government about why they have made a mistake, and that is the unique ability that pardons have. Two things that happen whenever you pardon. First, my partner's point about the symbolic meaning and the symbolic weight of this. This is a very public government apology that that they recognize the fault in the law and the way the law was executed. What this does is it forces the public to analyze what this law means and how we can best like, come to terms with it. We think we already see this in our society, in states that have legalized marijuana, on whether or not we should pardon people who have had these drug convictions. You get that same conversation about maybe, I don't know, the United States government targeted overall black communities in the way they prosecuted drug crimes. You get to have that conversation on our side of the house. But secondly, we think that there are practical realities that come from this, practical impacts, and that's how you end up getting all of the things that closing opposition wants. They want a better world for soldiers, and we do too, but you don't get to have that conversation if you cannot have conversations about the military in the first place. We help solve for these long-term structural problems that cause this by allowing the military to now reform to avoid desertion in the first place. You only get a better military, and you only get a country that is willing to understand and critique itself on our side of the house, proud to propose. Imagine the poor, marginalized soldier from an impoverished background that we got painted so clearly from the closing government. Now imagine the patriot that they also painted so clearly, the one with the toxic perception of America and American dominance of, and of how we're the greatest and the military should conquer everything, right? Now imagine the interaction between the two of them when that soldier returns home, knowing full well that everyone who deserted, everyone who left this now optional job was pardoned. That patriot inherently has a bias towards that person, especially if they're a person of color, as many soldiers are. What that patriot believes is that that person, that soldier, went to the front lines to make money for themselves to pursue this optional pr profession. Sure, it's dangerous, but so is like crab fishing in Alaska, right? And we don't give them the same respect as we give soldiers. When you take away the imperative that you are sacrificing for the collective, you take away the imperative of the collective to sacrifice back for you. That's why we are so incredibly proud to oppose this motion. The burden that was not met by side government was the idea that the soldier not only has some sort of responsibility to society, but to their fellow soldier. And we described to you how not only are soldiers impacted in the war zone when there's desertion, but they're also impacted in peacetime. We think the length and broadness of the impacts that this has in a structural way is gonna be a very clear reason to give this debate to the CEO. But first, let's go down some strategic flaws made by the government. First, out of opening half, we hear this idea that uh, in terms of like uh, wartime, you know, there's there's like this ethical dilemma, and people will want to quit because it's terrible, right? Yeah, sure, war is terrible, but they tell you nothing about the ethics of peace, right? So when I asked them a POI about Vietnam, about 
how soldiers were perceived when they returned home. They kind of like skirted around the, uh, the true analysis here, the true crux of the idea that Vietnam veterans were not welcome back into society in any sort of reasonable way in the United States. They were viewed as morally corrupt because of the idea that the war was opposed, but also because of the idea that this sacrifice that they made was an option, right? Like that they chose to do this because they were some sort of jangoist animals that wanted to go kill Vietnamese people. Because it was seen that they had that opt out, they could have left, but they stayed anyway. This was a huge cultural discussion, apparently, uh, especially among the more liberal community in the United States, about why Vietnam War veterans should not be treated very well. It was a big problem within the hippie movement, and like clearly, you're seeing that like if this continues and like you can just harden all war criminals, then there is going to be that same discussion again of how much soldiers should be valued. So the few that do deserve dramatically decrease the like, uh, welfare of the many when they return home, right? Um, but then let's move on to closing government. So in terms of like the shortcoming of the clash we see from closing, they tell you that there's this toxic patriotism. They never mechanize how that goes away in a world where there is Desert, or where there is pardoning for desertion, right? They tell you like, oh, there's gonna be like uh, some sort of like reevaluation of like us going to war, right? But that's not what's gonna happen if like soldiers are perceived as agents making a choice and having full agency to leave whenever they want, rather than like sacrificing for the collective and being held to a social contract, right? Like because whenever you analyze that war and you like say, oh, should we not maybe be putting soldiers at war? If you decrease not the perception of the United States government and military, but rather you decrease the public perception of the soldier in that they have the ability to leave but didn't, you are not targeting the right group in your major critique of war. And frankly, I don't think this desertion issue is going to be like enough to change the American culture of war. So instead, you have that same culture of toxic patriotism, but it's being lumped onto the soldiers, right? So even if we take them at the highest ground they have and say that in a vacuum, war justifies desertion, we tell you that, that because of the obligation that they have to their fellow soldiers based on this contract, that yes, even if they have a right to choose based on OG's highest ground, that they chose to engage in anyway, you're seeing that like uh, they, they uh, shirk their responsibility to their fellow soldier. You see that in wartime because they're not present, but you also see it in peacetime. Let's talk about the mechanisms for that and for the central argument why we went around. So we received interesting arguments from OO about like uh, military criminals, right? But we give you an argument that clashes much more substantially <laughs> around and one with big impacts in terms of quality of life. What is the link between like desertion and this like ethics of peacetime where soldiers see uh, less public perception, right? Two reasons why we buy this link. The first is the, is the uh, like comparative analysis, right? So because they're no longer sacrificing to the collective, but rather they're making a conscious choice where they always have the ability to leave, then the public perception shifts to this is a way to make money, this is a way to gain personal glory, right? It's like a crab fisher in Alaska. They have a higher death rate than soldiers in Afghanistan did, but we don't value them inherently because they're not making a sacrifice for the collective. They have this opt-out option whenever they want, so they're either going for money or they're going for like the enjoyment and glory of it. Right? This is especially true when you look at marginalized groups and you see individuals who are going to be like, oh, they were just there to make money, they could have like, left whenever they wanted. Right? That's going to be highly problematic in their perception, especially disproportionately impacting minority groups. The crux of why the soldier gets respect and why they are expected to like, uh, receive <coughs> stuff from the collective when they return home right. is, because of their, uh, is because of their sacrifice. But yes, I'll take back. The problem is that the stigma they're talking about already exists in the status quo. The only way to stop desertion in the long term is to solve for those root causes, which we cannot speak about in our society because it is viewed as un-American. You have to address that. Yeah, you still can't talk about why like war in the military is bad in your world either, right? There's still that toxic patriotism that exists. And know the like fact that because there's no desertion right now, soldiers are idolized because they're seen as making a sacrifice for the collective. They don't have this opt-out button, right? So clearly, like we value soldiers more in our world versus in your world, but in both worlds, we're still dealing with this toxic patriotism. So what is the impact on the soldier when they return home? We tell you some big things like mental health benefits, right? Those are already fairly limited and marginalized as this because the public perception of mental health care isn't great. So when you like remove this like respect for soldiers, you remove voters like interest in voting for candidates who are specifically like pro-veteran, pro-military, that becomes problematic for the uh, for the mental health care that they're likely to receive. And 
that kind of funding. Uh, you also decrease like provision, provisions like money for recovery from the time you spent before. Clearly, this long-term structural impact that marginalizes soldiers and doesn't solve their, their like inherent problem of toxic patriotism is going to win the round for CEO. Thank you. All right.